Um, I'm going to be talking about um, James Joyce and cinematicity, um, before and after film. Um, slight pretentious title, but hopefully it will, it will make some sense to you um, once, I, um, once I've explained it. The actual term cinematicity itself has come to denote, denote the tendency of late Victorian culture to conceptualise and represent the world in terms of moving and photographic images. And this, of course, culminated in the Lumiere cinematograph apparatus in 1895. However, many recent studies suggest that such a sense of movement in images and in thought, as it were, was emergent in virtually every form of representation in the late 19th century. Joyce's literary method was thus not solely a response to the cinematograph. It was imaginatively nourished and primed by an already sophisticated moving image and projection culture um, in its diverse forms. This culture comprised... Do you want me to move it on? Sorry. It's always easier to move persons than machines. <laughs> so, they rule the planet after all. Um, okay, so this projection culture in its diverse forms. This comprised, among other things, Victorian optical toys such as the, the zoetrope, um, stereoscope, panoramas and dioramas, the magic lantern and shadowgraph, rapid photographic studies and peep shows, which were based, of course, on Edison's kinetoscope. Now, many of these influenced, overlapped, and coexisted with cinema for some time, and virtually all their visual attractions and anatomizations of phenomena are referenced in Joyce's writing. Um, Joyce also imitates their effects, uh, sorry, also imitates their effects, um, and even elaborates them in his pages. And he does this with a kind of ekphrastic cinematicity that surpasses most other modernists. So by the time of publication of Ulysses uh, in 1922, the intermediality of Joyce's style with evolving cinematic techniques was so synergetically innovative and pervasive as to attract enthusiastic attention from filmmakers themselves. Most famously, of course, in the late 1920s, the Soviet montagist Sergei Eisenstein became convinced that the stretch of tension between words and images in the interior monologues in Ulysses might serve as a kind of template for filmmakers for using the newly perfected synchronized soundtrack in a much more creative way than was being done at that time. However, I would also argue that we can only fully understand the richness and creativity of Joyce's receptiveness to cinema when it did come, how his response came to seem so ahead of the game, as it were, to actual filmmakers, through examining its roots in the broader cinematicity of the moving image culture of the turn of the century. So I'm actually going to talk about Joyce's earlier works more, so, more than I'm going to do about Ulysses. And I'm going to talk about these various, um, uh, the various features of this moving image culture of the late 19th century that sort of predates the cinematograph. And I'm going to start with something called um, shadowgraphy. So from Joyce's earliest writings, we find a kind of fascination with moving images, um, with the play of light and shadow, with seeing pictures in darkened spaces, with frames, screens, and projection effects. According to Joyce's brother Stanislaus, when Joyce was quite young, he composed a series of sketches which he called silhouettes, and these were written somewhere um, around the middle of the 1890s. So Joyce would have been certainly under the age of 16 when he wrote, when he wrote these. And this is Stanislaus's description of um, silhouette number one, as it were. Stanislaus said that the first three stories, like the first three stories of Dublin, it was written in a first person singular and described a row of mean little houses along which the narrator passes after nightfall. His attention is attracted by two figures 
in violent agitation on a lowered window blind, illuminated from within. The burly figure of a man staggering and threatening with upraised fist, and the smaller, sharp-featured figure of a nagging woman. A blow is struck, and the light goes out. The narrator waits to see if anything happens afterwards. Yes, the window blinds illuminated again, dimly, by a candle, no doubt, and the woman's sharp profile appears, accompanied by two small heads, just above the window ledge, of children wakened by the noise. The woman's finger is pointed in warning. She's saying, don't waken, pa, and I've, il I've illuminated some of the words in that quotation to direct your attention to what Joyce has done here. Um, by having his narrator watch a private um, altercation publicly projected, as it were, against a nighttime blind, the young Joyce was self-consciously rendering the sketch's action as a series of moving images in a shadow graphic, dumb show-like display. Um, it's possible that the teenage Joyce might have seen a film show in Dublin as early as April 1896, when the cinematograph was first shown, along with rival versions of, of um, the new cinema um, by Robert William Paul. But the shadow show itself was already a proto-cinematic form of moving image entertainment, which dated back at least to the 18th century, and the vogue for silhouettes, as it were. This coincided, of course, with the importation of what were known as ombre chinois, Chinese shadow puppet shows, into Europe. But the Victorians also developed patent shadow graphs, which used adapted man magic lantern projectors, and these were, these were quite sophisticated. And indeed, um, when the Lumiers entrusted the, um, the debut of the cinematograph in London, in February 1896, of course it had already been shown in Paris in, in December, um, but when they showed it in London, they entrusted it to um, a professional magician called <coughs> Felicien Trouy, um, who was actually um, a specialist in shadow graphy. So it's as if they were kind of recognizing the connection, as it were, between shadow graphic projection and um, cinema when it actually arrived. And indeed, shadow graphic methods and forms are very much echoed in early films, uh, particularly in animation, in the um, silhouette cartoons of Pat Sullivan and Otto Mesmer, which we know as Felix the Cat, and in, and in feature-length animations by, um, by Lotte, Lotte Einiger, um, the German um, animator. And indeed, Joyce's early interest, I think, in shadow graphic projection also anticipates similar graphic and chiaroscuro tendencies which are widespread in German expressionist film. And these are very much epitomized by um, a film from 1922, it's the same year as Ulysses, um, which is usually called Warning Shadows in, in, in English, um, Schatten in, in German. And this film also has a lot in common thematically and technically with Ulysses. It's based on a kind of um, psychologically suggestive shadow play around the husband's jealousy complex, which is very much what's going on at the center of Ulysses as well. And in this image, of course, you can see the husband apparently seeing something through a nighttime blind, involving, as it were, an intimate moment between his wife and, uh, and, uh, and one of her lovers, as it, as it were, even though it's actually an, an illusion, a shadow graphic sort of um, tease, as it were. One of the most important of these um, proto-cinematic technologies was, of course, the magic lantern. And this was a key influence on the early Joyce. Uh, Victorian lantern shows were highly sophisticated and were one of the most widely attended and popular forms of entertainment, instruction, and persuasion um, in 19th century Britain and Ireland. And they're heavily referenced in many Anglophone writers, you know, as diverse as Dickens and H.G. Wells. Their method of projection often employed ingenious moving effects. Um, so, for example, in, in trick slides, you could watch a dog jump through a hoop, um, or you could watch a woman being sort of bucked by a mule, um, you know, 
the images, of course, would be kind of laid on top of each other, so the, the movement within them would be, uh, would be very striking and, um, you know, uh, and, and, quite, um, uh, and quite surprising and, and amusing. Their method um, was often produced mechanically from so-called slipper slides and, and so on. But there was also a more sophisticated and transitional kind of effect that could be achieved through dissolving view apparatuses. Um, so, for example, it was possible to create a kind of time-lapse effect between two, two slides, again, projected on top of each other, where you can see the same scene during the day, and then gradually it would become night, as it were. So it would be like a time-lapse effect. Um, or you could, come, you could produce extraordinary metamorphoses, you know, surreal metamorphoses that would turn you know, a beautiful young woman into a skeleton um, in an instant, as it were. So these dissolving views um, could shift through time and space. And they were, of course, enhanced in cinema itself in the form of a mix or crossfade, as well as devices like double exposure and other kinds of superimposition especially for paranormal effects, and I'll talk a bit more about those in a moment. Um, an Irishman played a key part in facilitating the development of dissolving views. Um, this was a, a, an Irishman called Edward Marmaduke Clarke, who was the son of the man who assisted um, Powell de Phillips Tower um, when he first bought the um, Phantasmagoria, which I'll explain a bit more about in a moment. Um, to Dublin in 1804. And it's likely that de Phillips style confided the technical secret of dissolving views to um, uh, Marmaduke Clark's father. The son then went on to invent something called the bicenoscope, um, which was especially um, created to display dissolving views by the new limelight gas. And this became the standard mechanism for um, dissolving view effects in the mid-Victorian period. You know, if, you were, if you were projecting dissolving views, you were likely to be using one of these Irish designed um, bicenoscopes, as it were. Now, the lantern figures in numerous respects in Joyce's first published text, um, his collection of short stories, Dubliners, um, which was published in 1914. Um, the short story, Grace, for example, names the lantern directly, and it hints at optical fakery in the miraculous apparition of the Virgin um, at Knock on the 21st of August, 1879. The central character, Tom Kernan, who's a recovering alcoholic, agrees to go on a reforming retreat <coughs> with the church, but he draws the line at visual superstition and says, I bar the magic lantern business. You know, so this is supposed to be a reference to the, you know, the trickery of the Knock, of the Knock miracle. However, far from Joyce barring its influence on his text, devices from Magic Lantern shows shed light on the text's technical mysteries. Most importantly, how Joyce appears to use a flashback form in numerous Dubliner stories several years before the technique's probable first use in cinema itself. So for example, in the short story Evelyn, we find that it's structured around cuts within the young girl's memory between contrasting moments in time and space, which enables Joyce to compress Evelyn's whole emotional prehistory and inner psychological struggle between daughterly commitment on the one hand and desire to escape into a mere four or five pages. So it's got this extraordinary kind of interlocking flashback structure. However, if we talk about it as flashback and compare it with cinema, we find that Evelyn was written in 1904, but the first true filmic flashback, in other words, achieved by editing, um, is often dated to D.W. Griffith's film, After Many Years, which wasn't actually made until 1908. Um, so what happens in Griffith's film, you know, with this first editorial flashback that historians have been able to kind of uncover, um, is that we see, um, we see Enoch, the central character, um, kissing a rocket on the desert island that he's been shipwrecked on. And then this suddenly cuts from the desert island to a close-up of his wife with outstretched arms on their porch at home. 
Um, and this alludes, as it were, to a shot that was shown at the beginning of the film. So it's a kind of flashback to that moment. <coughs> Griffith, of course, would go on to elaborate flashback into a principal narrative device um, in subsequent films. And he's very much associated you know, with, the, um, with the beginnings of the use of the flashback, particularly for psychologically determining moments. So if you compare after many years to Evelyn, we seem to have a kind of anachronism here. Um, and it, it could even be argued that Joyce is anticipating rather than being influenced by flashback techniques by editing. However, if you look at specialist studies of the flashback, such as Maureen Turin's book of that title, they seem to confirm that precedents and parallels show that the evolution of the flashback itself is actually tied to early, earlier visual media. So from at least the 1860s, Magic lantern slides often signified a kind of movement in time and space, a sort of multi-spatio-temporality, as it were, by superimposing or inserting images, often using proto, um, a sort of primitive photomontage techniques. And these, this was done in order to visualize the thoughts or fantasies of a character in the main scene. And I'll just show you a few um, magic lantern slides from the 1890s, from roughly the turn of the century which kind of show, as it were, a character in the foreground, and then a relationship with time and space, which in this case, from Robin Adair, as it were, is to do with um, the character imagining something going on elsewhere simultaneously. So she's a, she's a kind of Cinderella figure who hasn't got to the ball, but where her, um, her young man, as it were, is dancing um, with someone else. Um, in the next one, which is called The Scent of the Lily. Sorry about the reproduction of this. I was only able to get hold of this in black and white. But essentially, what these slides would have been would have been um, photographs, which were known as life model series at this time, but colored in by hand, painted by hand. So what's happening in this, in this scene is that the main character, who's an old man, is, is holding a bunch of lilies in his hands, and he's thinking about his youth and his dead love, as it were whom you can see kind of projected by dissolving view into the background of the, of the slide. Um, in this particular um, slide, which is from a series called The Curtain, which I think is very interesting, because it has a lot in common with Evelyn, who's sort of sitting at an open curtain with a window behind her, which is rather like a kind of screen. The young woman is kind of looking both into her past and into her future. And in this particular example, we can see her sort of looking into the future moment where she meets this eligible and athletic young man on a riverbank. So it's done again through the superimposition of a dissolving view in the background of the, of the main slide, you know, probably using something a bit like a bicenoscope. And then finally, I was going to show you this example from What Are the Wild Waves Saying, where we get a kind of dream state depicted where you know, a brother, brother and sister are asleep in their bedroom, but they're kind of dreaming about the rough sea, uh, which is potentially quite dangerous. And we see the dream, as it were, breaking through the wall of the room um, that they're asleep in. So it's an extraordinary kind of image, you know, which creates a kind of proto-surrealism, um, if you like. So as Maureen Turing puts it, in all probability, the earliest flashbacks in film use the same kind of image within image technique rather than the kind of edited cut to the past that we saw in the example from D.W. Griffith. I think it's also therefore likely that Joyce innovated his own literary equivalent to flashback in Dubliners from the parallel influence of magic lantern techniques, um, especially in these life model slides, which were very common in the 1890s and are like a kind of um, mediating uh, moment between um, you know, the fourth wall of theatre of realism and, as it were, the beginnings of film fiction. So I'm going to move on and talk about another story in Dubliners at this point. And this is in relation to the Phantasmagoria, uh, which I mentioned earlier. The image, of course, shows a phantasmagorist you know, creating the illusion of a spook by back projection. Um, probably somewhere around the middle of the, of the 19th century. By that time, of course, the Magic Lantern had a venerable reputation as a kind of technology of the uncanny, if you like. 
especially when it was used in the Phantasmagoria, uh, which was essentially um, a kind of show in which moving spooks would be materialized on concealed roller screens, or indeed even projected onto smoke, which is a very effective and, and um, scary kind of um, effect. Um, the Phantasmagoria, which was actually coined by Powell de Phillips Tarr as a term, um, dates back to the 1790s. And indeed, it was Powell de Phillips Tarr, under his professional name of Philidor, who first, first brought the Phantasmagoria to Dublin um, in the early 19th century. And this, of course, is the, the link with Marjorie Clark's family. Appropriately, uh, the Phantasmagoria was first shown in Capel Street in Dublin, which is also the same street where Leo Bloom in Ulysses visits the first mutoscope parlour in the Nausicaa episode. And it's interesting that you know, the Nausicaa episode in the Linati schema, which is a kind of key to Ulysses, describes that particular chapter as being about projected mirages. So you know, we have the Phantasmagoria and the mutoscope more or less the same location, um, with, but with a century between them. Because Ulysses, of course, is set in 1904. Similarly, although Grace eschews lanternism when it comes to holy ghosts, you know, that's why Tom Kern says, I bar the magic lantern business, Joyce nonetheless evokes lanternism for uncanny visions in the final story of Dubliners, the dead. So towards the end of the day, we, know, we see Joyce knowingly arranging his final kind of mise-en-scene, if you like, with effects which are very reminiscent of a phantasmagoria. Um, the hotel bedroom that the central characters um, occupy at that point is lit only by a long shaft from one window to the door. Um, it's actually a light from a street lamp outside, but effectively it acts like a kind of magic lantern or film projector beam from which an occult presence might materialize. And I've kind of illustrated that from a, another slide from the 1890s, which uses a similar sort of self-conscious effect of a kind of beam of light coming in through a window above a door and a spectre, as it were, appearing at the end of it, materializing at the end of it. Gabriel sort of visualizes a kind of spectral other world, which is inhabited by his dead rival, Michael Fury, and he feels irresistibly drawn towards this after Greta reveals to him that, you know, that she's lamenting this, this dead lover from her youth. So the story, I think, displays a sense of how the magic lan lantern passed on its effects to film as a kind of successor technology of the uncanny. Gabriel watches a kind of shadowy other world gradually materialize around him. And it's no accident, I think, that Joyce deploys a cluster of effects and terms which are familiar from early movie watching and part of the evolving technical vocabulary of cinemat cinematicity itself. But all these terms, as it were, which are adopted by Phil, are actually taken over from the Magic Lantern and from the Phantasmagoria uh, in particular. Gabriel spooks, we're told, like figures on the silent screen, have an unstable, flickering existence. This is how the ghosts kind of materialize. We're also told that his self-image is fading out into their monochrome impalpability. You know, so Joyce is actually using this technical vocabulary from the Phantasmagoria and from, uh, from uh, its legacy, as it were, as taken up by early film. Conversely, the substantial world that Gabriel was once, felt, once felt, felt so secure in, is dissolving and dwindling, we're told. You know, so the actual term dissolve is used at the climactic moment of this, of this story. So Gabriel's awareness of this other dimension that he feels kind of taking shape around him, overlapping and gradually erasing ours, also resembles a kind of mixing effect which cinema took over from the dissolving views of lantern shows, in which images occupy the same space, one gradually fading up, as it were, to oust the other which is fading away. And that's precisely what happens to Gabriel's sense of reality, you know, to the real world being taken over by the ghost world um, at the end of the day. 
Joyce also ends the story with a kind of poignant montage of snow falling general all over Ireland, as the weather forecast puts it. Um, the snow also erases all the differences between the living and the dead. Snowfall, um, especially around Christmas time, and the dead is a kind of Christmas ghost story, was famous amongst the Magic Lantern's repertoire of moving effects. So you could create, as it were, moving snowfall over a lantern image by winching one of these things over the second lens. Um, they're called snow effect roller blinds. Um, so Joyce, you know, by having this kind of snowfall effect at the end of the dead, seems to be extending that kind of association with lantern images um, and ingeniously representing the material world at the end of the story in a way which isn't just like kind of moving photographic images, but is also rendered kind of visually and ontologically indistinguishable from this kind of shadowy counterpart that's taking over um, Gabriel's reality. And I think he does this in a way which both references cinema's active inheritance from predecessor technologies, such as the Magic Lantern, but also in some sense anticipates the narrative futures of, the, of that legacy. Of course, The Dead is the final story of, of the collection, but it's also the story that's written um, latest, so it's probably finished around 1909, um, by which time you know, cinema is already uh, a decade and a, and a half old, almost. You know, so it's appropriate, as it were, that Joyce is beginning to move away from these 19th century technologies and into what the cinema has absorbed from them and is also pushing, as it were, forward. Now, um, how am I doing for time? Um, I thought we got about 10 minutes, quarter of an hour, yeah? At least. OK, right. Um, with that case, I have got a reasonable amount of time to talk about um, the portrait of the artist as well, which, of course, is the, the second work of fiction that Joyce publishes in 1914-15. Now, um, the device I'm showing you here is called the Zoetrope. And in an auspicious coincidence that would have pleased Joyce, who had you know, an interest in both optics and, and also in wordplay, the zoetrope was originally um, called something else. Um, it's, it's a machine that takes an ingenious advantage of the persistence of vision effect to animate sequences of still images. However, it wasn't originally called the zoetrope at all. When it was first invented in 1834, it was called the Daedalum, or Daedalum, I suppose. Um, and that original name is possibly one of the things that influenced Joyce's choice of name for the protagonist of the novel, which we know as a portrait of the artist as a young man. Because, of course, his surname is, is Daedalus, and it echoes, as it were, the mythic uh, sort of Greek inventor um, that Joyce references so much through the text. But it also possibly echoes the original name for the zoetrope um, as well. And the zoetrope was one of the most common of Victorian optical toys. Everyone, more or less everyone, would have seen a zoetrope or handled one, probably even had one at home. So I think that it's the case that Victorian optical culture and the kind of experiments in cinematicity that the zoetrope represents, and it was invented by a British scientist and mathematician called William Horner. You can see these experiments inexorably moving towards um, creating a projecting device which can convincingly represent empirical reality in motion. You know, so all of these strands, as it were, lead towards um, the cinematograph itself um, by 1895. They're all, they're all important components in uh, what creates the cinematograph. Now, Joyce, when he published Ulysses, certainly seems to intensify a kind of literary emulation of visual analysis of movement over time. And this, of course, as I'm referencing here with Mybridge's famous images of a, um, you know, animal lo locomotion studies, of, um, which show that all four of the horse's hooves actually leave the ground uh, when it gallops. This, of course, was one of the primary scientific and technical drives, technological drives, sorry, which led to the creation of cinema in the first place. 
So I think it's, it's certainly well recognized that modernist writing and scientific inquiry in the late 19th century are sharing a kind of preoccupation with fixing the transient moment for examination. You know, looking at the world in a new way which goes beyond, you know, the way that that world can be seen by the naked eye. So it's a kind of prosthetic, technologically enhanced vision which begins to fascinate modernist writers. And indeed, this is something that other modernist writers recognize in Joyce's work. Um, uh, for example, in the case of Virginia Woolf, when Woolf was reading the serialized Ulysses in 1918, um, she described the novel as possibly like a cinema that shows you very slowly how a horse does jump. So it's as if Woolf is recognizing that connection, as it were, um, between Joyce and rapid photographic analysis. Um, and of course, she then goes on to say, all the pictures were a little made up before, and then kind of finishes by saying, here is thought made phonetic, taken to bits. So on the one hand, she's saying that Ulysses is almost like a kind of um, a slow motion scientific film that shows you, you know, how animals really move. But on the other hand, she's also talking about the kind of consciousness behind the camera and the way that this new way of seeing has also brought an emphasis onto cognitive processes and, and consciousness and so on. So slow motion scientific films made it possible to replicate and anatomize natural phenomena in ways which were impossible for the naked eye to, to follow. And they've grown out of you know, the work of people like, like Moybridge, which Wolf is recognizing has a kind of affinity with Joyce's parallel trajectory. And indeed, she wasn't the only person who thought this. Um, Joyce's artist friend, Frank Budgen, who wrote a very famous book about the making of Ulysses, thought that Joyce had written the best um, description of animal movement in literature to that, up to that point. So he argued that in, in the same way that no one had seen how a horse really gallops before Moybridge, no one had really seen how a dog runs until Joyce had written um, uh, chapter 3 um, of, of Ulysses, uh, which is called Proteus. Or at least the apprehension of a running dog by an observing subject would be a better way of putting it. However, that observing subject constantly thinks in photographic terms. So in the same chapter, just after the description of the running dog through Stephen's eyes, um, Stephen, we find, is also meditating suggestively on the processes and virtual effects of photography, um, particularly in relation to depth and perspective. So he's analyzing the way in which he sees and thinking in terms of you know, that strange oscillation that we get in the photographic image between two-dimensionality and three-dimensionality. And he, he mentions in the process of that another Victorian optical toy, the stereoscope. Here's a stereoscopic viewer. Um, from that period, or an illustration of one, you know, which shows someone looking at two sort of neatly aligned photographic images in order to create a kind of three-dimensional effect out of them. So this is very much what's on Stephen's mind um, in Proteus. Click does the trick, I'll just return to that quotation, falls back suddenly, frozen in stereoscope. Click does the trick. It's, it's as if Stephen is kind of mentally taking the photograph himself at that point, you know, snapping, as it were the dog on the horizon of the, uh, of the beach. So this leads me, this leads me into um, the very first version of a portrait of the artist. Um, I don't know whether people are aware, but Joyce wrote a kind of 10-page um, autobiographical sketch, um, which he tried to publish in 1904. And this is where he first comes up with part of the title of a portrait of the artist. So it's not quite yet the portrait of the artist as a young man, as it were. Um, it's just a portrait of the artist. So I think, we can, I think we can trace the visually and psychologically anatomizing tendency that people like Wolf and Budgeon see in Ulysses much further back into this very first version um, of a portrait of the artist. The novel 
that's published under that name, of course, has got a very famous camera-eyed focalization and a sort of montage structure. Um, and this seems to be similarly rooted in Joyce's speculations about a possible method for representing the perceptions of a mind developing over time in the very first version of the text, which is this 1904 portrait. Um, I've quoted the first paragraph of it for you here. Um, and it's, it, it contains some very odd metaphors, very strange kind of writing, with weird images of trying to kind of abstract, you know, from sort of photographs or pictures taken over a long time, a, a kind of rhythm that interconnects them and which sort of develop, shows the development of a kind of body and a consciousness, um, you know, as that person is growing older. So I think what, this, what these metaphors do is to point towards an experimental psychological purpose and a sort of moving interior form which becomes lost in the sprawling naturalism of Joyce's second version of the portrait, which is known as Stephen Hero. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with Joyce's work, you'll know that there are three different versions of the portrait. Um, and it's only that final one that Joyce actually published in his lifetime. However, I think we can see the 1904 portrait as a kind of manifesto for the purpose that got lost in the second version, but was then achieved in the structure and the, and the um, style um, of the final text. So I'll just read this out to you quickly. Um, Joyce begins in 1904 by saying, the features of infancy are not commonly reproduced in the adolescent portrait. Um, for so capricious a we, we cannot or will not conceive the past in any other than its iron memorial aspect. Yet the past implies a fluid succession of presents. It's a very interesting phrase now. The development of an entity in which our present is a phase only. And then he goes on to say that, you know, the, the real task is to liberate from the personalized lumps of matter. And I think what that suggests is kind of photographs taken or pictures of someone at different stages of their life that which is their individuating rhythm. A portrait is not an identi... I, uh, I also thought I'm saying this, an identificative paper, um, but rather the curve of an emotion. Now those are very strange metaphors. And where are they coming from, as it were? Right? How does Joyce get hold of those? How do those get into the text? Well, I would argue that what they're related to is key moments in cinema's cultural and technological prehistory. One of these I've mentioned already, uh, Mybridge's animal locomotion studies. Um, but the other one is um, a, a, a practice called chromophotography by a French um, scientist called Etienne Jules Marais, which was working in parallel to um, Mybridge's um, animal locomotion studies. And I'll just show you a chrono photograph. Um, I'll explain how this was brought about in, in a moment. But this is a kind of three-stage chrono photographic study of someone sort of running, basically. Um, and it's a very strange kind of undulating curve or rhythm, as it were, which shows development of movement over time um, in an extraordinary kind of way. Um, but both Mare and Mybridge are essentially capturing transitory phenomena and materializing time by a kind of mechanical means. And these photographic techniques, you know, uh, uh, which are, are kind of complementary, if you like, um, are slicing up and recomposing continuous action into a series of related visual moments in order to isolate and apprehend physical reality more accurately than the unassisted eye and brain can do. I'm just going to rapidly skip over the next couple of um, images. Um, well, I can talk about them later if anyone's interested. Moybridge, of course, invented um, this particular de device. Um, Victorian patent optical devices often have almost unpronounceable names. So the machine that he invented is called the Zoopraxiscope. And he essentially invented this in a way which anticipates um, you know, what cinema will, will do. Um, so, the, in, in 1879, um, Mybridge combined the Magic Lantern projector and a device called the Phenokistoscope, which was based on a rotating disc with images around the edge of it. 
um, to, in order to animate you know, photographs like the, um, the famous image of the, running, of the running horse. So essentially, you, know, you could watch it like a kind of short film um, projected under a zero praxiscope. And I think what's happened here is that those consecutively arranged spills, which we saw on the famous Stanford print just now, have been turned into a genuinely fluid succession of presents. That's the phrase, that's one of the phrases from the 1904 portrait, one of those strangely puzzling phrases. Fluid succession of presents. Um, which can be run both forwards and backwards in time. You know, so it's again a bit, a bit like a, a bit like a kind of film loop. Now I'm now going to sh I'm now going to go on to show you how Mafe achieved those extraordinary chronophotographic images, which seem to relate to Joyce's idea of you know a kind of curve uh, of, of um, emotion or a sort of psychological rhythm, as it were. Um, what Mari did was to take photographs of athletes. Um, against a black velvet background, wearing black velvet suits, but with the lines of muscular thrust kind of picked out in, in white. So you end up with an effect like that. So from individual photographs of a running man, you can liberate from the personalized lumps of matter their individuating rhythm, this sort of curve of rising and falling curve of movement. And there's something extraordinarily suggestive about this, um, you know, sort of abstracting from the moving body and its separate movements, um, an abstract curve that's kind of rising and falling in space. Now, rapid photography as a means of visual analysis aroused great interest in the Dublin in which Joyce grew up. So, for example, um, a local artist and photographer, the man who actually founded the Dublin Photographic Society, who's called Michelangelo Hayes, published a pamphlet two years before Muybridge took his famous Stanford images, um, a pamphlet called The Delineation of Animals in Rapid Motion, which clearly showed the position of a galloping horse's legs. Um, and Hay neither Hayes nor Muybridge knew about each other's work at the time. However, Hayes also demonstrated um, his work by using uh, a phenohistoscope, which looks like that, basically. You know, so he got there ahead of my bridge in a way. The one thing he didn't do was to project these images, you know, sort of cinematically, as, as it were. But you could watch this movement um, as a kind of moving image through a moving image device. Joyce certainly knew about Hayes because he mentions him in Ulysses on a number of a number of occasions. Mybridge himself, however, did come to Ireland. You know, during Joyce's youth, um, and he lectured to the Photographic Society and demonstrated his zero praxiscope um, in Dublin in 1890. However, an even more suggestive parallel in relation to Mare uh, is this character here, um, who was um, basically Franco Irish, um, a man called Lucian Bull, who was born in Dublin um, in the late 19th century to an Irish and French Irish father and French mother but that he then moved to France on his maturity and became the great chronophotographer photographer, uh, Etienne Jules Marais' personal assistant. And when Marais died in 1904, it was Bull who then took over and ran the Institut Marais and um, extended Marais' project of visual, visual analysis from, as it were, chronophotography and into high-speed film. And in this image here, we can see Bull demonstrating high-speed um, filmic analysis of insect flight. So there are these extraordinary connections between the Dublin of Joyce's youth and both um, anim animal locomotion studies and chronophotography, which I think is extraordinarily suggestive of certainly circumstantial evidence that Joyce knew about this kind of work, um, if, if nothing else, as it were. Of course, Mybridge and Mare's work is foundational for cinema itself. It was after Edison became familiar with their work that he set his research team to go about building um, the kinetoscope, which is a moving image peep show, um, which then became the basis for the Lumiere's cinematograph once they cracked the, um, the question of projection. 
So we can see, you know, a, a very close series of historical connections here, which don't just bring in Joyce, but also kind of lead to cinema itself. There is one peep show, sorry, there is one moving image device that Joyce mentions directly um, in Ulysses, and this, of course, is a version of the kinetoscope. Um, it was known as the mutoscope and was a kind of cheaper machine because it didn't work by electricity, it worked by a kind of hand-cranked mechanism. Um, but was nonetheless still a kind of peep, a moving image peep show rather than, as it were, um, a projected image. And this, of course, is mentioned in the Nausicaa episode of Ulysses and forms the kind of principal theme um, of, the, of the episode. However, I think what's been, what was happening in a portrait, and a portrait is a kind of key link in all of this, is that in the very first version, we find Joyce hypothesizing a kind of literary means for figuring the psychosensory movement of an individual consciousness developing over time. And that this is equivalent to the way that rapid photography is dissecting and recomposing physical <coughs> and, and also drawing attention to the processes of perception. So Joyce is using these technical, these experiments as a kind of technical precedent and a sort of guiding metaphor for what he finally achieved in the, in the published version um, of, of the novel. Um, the final novel, of course, has a very intense vo vocalization technique. Perhaps more than any fiction before, it gives the reader a sense of seeing through the central character's eyes. Um, and at the same time, we get um, a kind of rhythmic structure through which Stephen's thoughts maintain an imagistic association which overlaps present perceptions and accumulating memories. And this, of course, is tracing a kind of timeline through the novel that pushes dynamically onwards towards Stephen's vocational future as an artist. I think there's a kind of rising and falling pattern at work of both recurrent personality traits and adaptive responses. You know, again, kind of modeled on that sort of rhythm that's been kind of liberated from the individual sort of body at a given instant in those images. Joyce, of course, calls this the individuating rhythm in that first version of the portrait, but it's certainly got a kind of cinematic uh, structure to it. And I think this is simultaneously the underlying topic and form of the published novel. So a portrait of the artist is highly modernist in the way that it creates the effect of a kind of mobilized virtual gaze, of seeing through that character's eyes. However, vision isn't just a question of moving through physical space, it's also moving through mental space and time as well. There's an enhanced kind of vision which is analyzing visible reality, but also the seer behind the camera eye. So this is a key stage, I think, in Joyce's um, project in relation to cinematicity. And to borrow Wolf's words again, to just kind of remind you of what she said, um, this, prop, this key stage exposes how all the pictures were a little made up before, um, whilst rendering thought phonetic taken to bits. And I think a portrait is doing both, really, isn't it? It's giving both a camera eye perspective, but also sort of examining the consciousness behind that camera eye as well. So I'm going to stop at that point, and I do apologize if I've kind of run over time after we did. <laughs>